Hello, I'm Sean Finnegan, and you are listening to Restitutio, a podcast to get you thinking about biblical and historical Christianity, to challenge you to follow Christ, and to inspire you to lead a consecrated life. Today we are beginning a new series called Misunderstood Texts About Jesus with Bill Schlegel. Professor Schlegel lived and taught the Bible and geography in Israel for more than three decades. Recently, he came to change his mind on the deity of Jesus, seeing him now as God's man rather than a God-man. Since he made this change, a number of friends and acquaintances have brought up a number of scriptures that they believe proves Jesus is God. This podcast series is Schlegel's opportunity to answer these commonly misunderstood verses and explain what they mean. In this episode, we discuss five verses from the Gospel of John, and then in the next time, we'll do five more. Here now is Interview 43, Misunderstood Texts About Jesus, Part 1, with Bill Schlegel. Welcome to Restitutio, Bill. Great to be here, Sean. Thanks for getting in touch. Last time we talked about your journey and the various situations that occurred in the aftermath, if you will, of your reconsideration of who the Son of God is from a biblical perspective. And since that's happened, a number of folks have put together lists of verses, and I know you've been in dialogue with some folks about different texts that they bring up to try to convince you that you were right the first time and that you should not have changed your beliefs about Jesus. So I thought today we could look through a number of these in the Gospel of John. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, are, there are different verses on either side of, of every issue, of course, uh, but it, as it turns out, there's a concentration of texts in the Gospel of John that uh, perennially come up as proof texts of the deity of Christ. Mm -hmm. and Indeed. uh, I thought maybe we could just begin in the beginning um, and and get your thoughts on John 1.1, which reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then we skip to verse 14, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory as of the only Son of God from the Father, full of grace and truth. So we know that uh, it says the Word was God in verse 1. In verse 14, it says the Word became flesh, and that is referring to the Son. So therefore, the Son of God just is God. So how, how, that's the typical way of approaching this text. How have you seen this differently? Well, hey, Sean, the first thing I would say is that you and I aren't the first people to look at this, of course, and there have been a lot of like-minded People, people that believe in one God and his human Lord, Messiah, Jesus, have looked at this. And I've kind of found that a lot of my friends approach this text with a sense of blinders on. Like they, they can't even uh, think of a different way to perhaps look at the text. Right. It's been, and it's not necessarily their fault. There's been 1,700 or so years of interpretation tradition here, but let's just keep in mind, we want to seek the truth, we, want to, we don't want to stick our heels down and defend a dogma, if all that dogma is, is precepts of men. And I really think that there is a different way to look at this, uh, the book of John, and I think you'll say, make the point that it's one of the greatest, I don't really like the word Unitarian books, Uh, because I don't really know what it means. It's Latin, but it means one God in a sense. I I like that phrase better. How about monotheistic? Yeah, even that's Greek, right? (laughs) So the Lord is one. And so I think there is a a way to look at the book of John and understand it much better, knowing that here's John. John is a Jew. He is. If, it's, if we got the right guy, and I do believe that we do, he's an apostle from Galilee. And he's not going to, in one verse, or if you take the whole prologue of his gospel, verses 1 through 18, in 18 verses, all of a sudden, tell the Jewish world, uh, by the way, our God is actually 
two persons. There's been another person back there with him from eternity past. Surprise. It's, it's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so if that's the way we're looking at this book, perhaps that framework is, is faulty. And I think there is going to be a better way to look at the book. When you read this book, even in a Hebrew translation, and we found some Israelis don't know there's such a big issue with John 1.1. 1, 1. In America, the first thing that happens when, this is probably the first verse, maybe the second, when I tell somebody, I don't believe that Jesus is God in the flesh, they'll say, what about John 1.1? 1, 1? Right. Okay. It's like a knee-jerk reaction. Yeah, it seems that everybody thinks John 1.1 1, 1 tells us that Jesus, the Messiah, is God. Or they won't even say Jesus is the Messiah. Because, by the way, Messiah kind of gets dropped out. As soon as he's God, it doesn't really matter if he's Messiah or not. Right. So Jesus is God. But, and you read it in Hebrew, it doesn't jump out at you that way. Or the possibility isn't there for that kind of, hmm, let's not say philosophical, but the bent on it, on this word, word. You read this in Hebrew, in the beginning was the word. And that word in Hebrew is devar. And what does devar mean? It means a word, a thing, okay? It's, that's the second main meaning of it, a thing or a matter or an event. So when you read this in, with the Hebrew background or mindset, biblical, I would say, mindset, you are thinking, oh, this is the word of God. It's not a second person that John is trying to tell us about here. This is God's word. There's an obvious comparison to Genesis where God spoke and brought things into existence by his spoken word. It's the power of God expressed. Now, the Jews of all people know this. Us in the pagan Gentile world, if I can get by in saying that, we kind of, we don't really, it's not in our background to think that the almighty creator who made everything, including the trees I'm looking at through the windows right now and the blue sky and the cloud behind it, and what's ever beyond that, and the green grass, the one who made all of this communicates with us through word, okay? It's the medium through which God communicates to us. This is the way a biblical-minded person would read John 1.1, 1, 1, okay? Not from a Greek philosophical perspective, this whole idea of the logos being another person, or being some kind of impersonal force, I don't think that's what John is saying. If he's saying that at all, and I don't really think he is, but if he is at all, I would say he's doing it in a polemic way. He's telling these Gentiles, look at you folks out there that think the Logos is some, you know, what's it, in our time, it's sort of the force be with you. Of right, Star, Star Wars. Wars. Yeah. <laughs> this impersonal force, that Logos that maybe was involved with the design and order, uh, okay, that's our God, okay? That's his expression. It's, and by the way, he has a personal name. His name is yod heh vav -He. However, we're going to pronounce his name, Yehovah, Yahweh. It's our God. This is his word. He's the one that's doing this, okay? This is what John is trying to tell us, I think, in the beginning of his gospel. Yeah, yeah. So what you're saying then is that you should not read into verse 1 that the equation, the Word just is the Son. Oh, absolutely not. Look, at it. it doesn't work, okay? It doesn't work to say, to read John 1, 1 something like this. And this, this is our friend Anthony that says this, and he's absolutely right. In the beginning was the second person of the Trinity. And the second person of the Trinity was with the first person of the Trinity. And the second person of the Trinity was the first person of the Trinity. Uh-oh. You see, there's something wrong with the way that's being read. Now, you can play with the, the words a little bit, you know, change the meaning of God and from one part of the verse to another. But somehow, we don't recognize the inconsistencies in trying to understand the verse that way. Right. So right. absolutely not. The well, word here is not a person. That's the idea. It's not a, it's, it can be personified. There's no doubt about it, All right? Of the, course, the great parallel is the book of Proverbs, chapter 8, where here is wisdom, okay? And by the way, not only wisdom, but also understanding and orma. Orma is 
sometimes translated prudence. It's probably not the best way to look at it. These are persons, but especially chokhmot, the feminine, is wisdom, is there with God from the beginning. And he or she is there when God laid the foundations of the world, when he brought out the mountains, there's wisdom. Well, you read Proverbs, and we understand there's not another person. We understand that wisdom is being personified, but right. it's really a characteristic of God. Another good way to see this, I, I challenge people to simply open up and read Psalm 33, verse 6, and tell me if you think there is a second person back there with yod Yahweh, God Almighty, the Lord, with him creating. What does Psalm 33, 6 says? By the word of the Lord, okay, the devar, the devar yod When I say yod you don't understand what that means. It's Yahweh's personal name, okay? My Trinitarian friends, they really have a hard time figuring out who Yahweh is. If it's God the Father, God the Son, all of the Trinity together, it's, it's embarrassing, quite honestly. But because it's a personal name, we read in the, in the Hebrew Scriptures, this is the personal name of God. By the word of Yahweh, Psalm 33, 6, by the word of Yahweh, the heavens were made, and by the spirit of his mouth, their hosts were set up, all of their hosts. Okay? Now, you read Psalm 33, 6, you don't see another person back there. Why not? There's the word. The word is there with God. Why don't we see another person? We know why not, because he's not there. This is the expression of the one God. Right, right. All right, so w- when it comes to John 1, 14, how do you read that? The word became flesh. The ultimate expression of God Almighty is in this one, Jesus, the Messiah. He's a human being. He's flesh. He dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And here's another thing about that verse. As it goes on, it says, We behold, we beheld his glory, glory as of the unique Son from the Father. Now here's another thing. In the Hebraic biblical mindset, the Son of God, it's very clear who this is. It's a messianic title. The idea of the Son of God does not deal in the Bible with essence, okay? Because I have a child, a son, he's also a human being in essence, okay? This is the way we Greek thinking Gentiles took it or understood it. It does not mean that. In the Hebrew Bible, it deals not with essence, but with status and, yes, relationship, intimacy, these kinds of things. It doesn't deal with essence. It's the status. And the Son of God in the Scriptures is the Davidic Messiah. He is the one who will be the king in the age to come. Because another characteristic that this Hebrew idiom, I think it's fair to say, Son of God means, is he will be heir. He's going to inherit this earth. He's going to rule this earth. So when you read John 1.14, you're understanding that this heir, the king, is going, he's the one that has now become flesh in Jesus. He is is flesh. He is Jesus, as his name will be revealed in just a little bit. So you you would then say that the word is not Jesus until it becomes Jesus in verse 14, right? Yeah, that's an interesting question, uh, because definitely, as we know, that these pronouns, especially in the following verses, they can be translated with a neuter, okay? It was in the beginning with God. It's definitely for sure the case. There's no need to capitalize W like our English texts do in John 1.1. 1, 1. This is a translator's interpretation. And that word becomes, yes, becomes the human being in verse 14. Now, I say that with some hesitancy, Because, as you well know, there is the possibility to interpret all of John 1, the prologue, relating to the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. And I'm, I'm somewhat angling this way. I'm studying it, right? We're learning. There's no doubt about it. I'll tell you why. Because 
we see the same kind of language in all the other Gospels. Matthew starts out, this is the genesis of Jesus the Messiah. Okay, The word genesis in Matthew 1. 1. And you have Mark saying the beginning. It's the same word here that we see in John. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. Okay, you have the same idea, beginning. And it's relating to the beginning of his ministry, I think, for a very specific reason that we'll get to in a second. Also, Luke uses the same kind of an idea. This is the beginning, and he also has the word logos. Okay, and in Luke chapter 1, verse 2 or 3, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, it's very quick in the book of Luke. So it is the same in the book of First John. That which was, here is using the neuter for sure. That which was from the beginning, which our eyes have seen, we've held, we've touched, okay, concerning the word, the word of life. So there are some, and I think it's a viable interpretation. I'm, I'm not discounting it, and I'm not wholeheartedly accepting it yet. I'm still studying. That this, the, the parallel here, of course, is with the creation in Genesis. We have that same kind of language in the beginning. We have light. We have life all in Genesis, but as you know, and I know, and this is one of the things I did not understand when I was a Trinitarian, there is a focus in the Bible on the new creation, the next creation, and Jesus is the fulcrum of that next creation. He is going to be the channel, like Adam is the first man now, from which we all of us in creation exist, Jesus in the new creation is the one through whom every single human being will live, okay? So yes, with the beginning, and here's another reason why the Gospel of John, very interesting. Why all this, what, what, here we've got all this idea of, you know, in the beginning was the word and so forth. And John the Baptist, he's in verse six for crying out loud. What's he doing in verse six, John the Baptist? And then he comes again right there, uh, what is it, verse 19, I think. He's got John the Baptist in there. Mm -hmm. It's another possibility to understand this as, this is the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. It's the beginning of God's new creation. And this is, this is, this is Colossians. Okay? As a Trinitarian, I could not understand Colossians either, where Paul says, all right, God the Father has transferred us from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of his Son. Okay, This is our hope. This is our expectation, to participate in the kingdom of of God, the kingdom on this earth where Jesus is the ruler. And there he begins to say that Jesus is the firstborn of creation. Through him all things were made. Okay, now you look at that and you say the word things is not in there and you can see the context. He's talking about powers and authorities, etc., etc. So here is the firstborn of creation. How could Jesus if you want to call him God the Son, in my old Trinitarian way of thinking, how can he be the firstborn from the dead, the firstborn of creation? It's because he is the firstborn of that new creation. Okay, He's a human being, the, the first one to be resurrected from the dead. And now, as Colossians says, he's the image of God, right? and he is seated at the right hand of God. This is where he is. Okay? This is where the glorified human Jesus is right now, and we're waiting. We're waiting for him to come back and set up God's kingdom on this earth. Now, how did I get on all that? Because of the idea of it's possible to look at the prologue of John and understand it as the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, the beginning of God's new creation. Here's another thing. When you read John 1.1, in the beginning was the word. What? I thought God was in the beginning. There's no word without God even in the Trinitarian idea, all right? So there's something different. There's something not clicking with our typical interpretations of the prologue of John, and it might be because we've been blinded or we've got blinders on, okay? And I, if, if it is this, Sean, I'll tell you, like I say, I'm studying myself right now. If it is this, we have been hoodwinked for centuries. If John 1 is really talking about the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, and like I say, I'm still studying this. I'm not jumping in the pool with right. both feet. But yeah. if it is, we've been hoodwinked. Okay? So, related to your question there and him becoming flesh. No, absolutely. 
This is God's expression. God Almighty, the one God. This is his word that's become flesh. This is how he is going to communicate with to us, mm -hmm. to humanity, through Jesus, the Messiah, born of a virgin, descended from Abraham, descended from David. All right, well, let's move on then to verse 18. Um, and then uh, we've got a number of other texts in the Gospel of John here. Sorry uh, for taking so long. <laughs> Just got to move you along here. You uh, better. Verse 18 says, No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. That's the English Standard Version. And uh, yeah. so a lot of folks, they're going to be saying that this other God here, no one has ever seen God, and it says the only God or the only begotten God, depending on... Uh, which version you're reading, or the only begotten Son, um, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. What, what are your thoughts on, on this text? Because there are a couple of different things going on here from a manuscript perspective as well mm -hmm. as from an interpretation point of view. Yeah. Well, I think when you trace the manuscript evidence, and I, I think even most Trinitarian textual scholars are going to agree with this, that the idea that he's the only begotten God, as I think you read the ESV there, uh, well, says, actually, it's even worse. It says the only God. That's all it says. Only God. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, so, it's, it's ironic, too, because it says no one has ever seen God. Then it says the only God who is at the Father's side. Yeah. It's a little confusing. So, when you trace the textual evidence, you can see that this is a corruption. And it also is an evidence of the, you might even say, the desperation of somebody who wants to prove the deity of Jesus. But the best understanding is that no one has ever seen God. The unique son, it's not even begotten here, it's unique, it's monogene, so some places it might have the idea of birth. But I really think it's mostly relating to the uniqueness of Jesus, the unique son. And again, we can't, I can't overemphasize this. Son of God in the biblical mindset does not mean God the son. There is no such thing in the Bible as God the Son. It is a Hebrew idiom, a figure of speech, you might even say, which is applied especially to the Messianic king, but not uniquely, but always to created beings, as well as to other humans, but especially to this descendant of David who's going to be the king, the Messiah, who we're waiting for, to come and bring the rule of God on earth like we pray every time as Jesus taught us to pray. Thy kingdom come. It means God's rule on this earth through his designated Messiah who's been shown to be Jesus. So this, this verse is, no one's ever seen God, the only unique son, right? Who is in the bosom of the Father. Very interesting phrase there. He has made him known. It's the intimacy idea. Again, I think it's really the same It's a way of saying like Paul did in Colossians. Where is Jesus? He's at the right hand of right. the Father. Okay? Mm -hmm. And he has this unique, intimate relationship. He's the only one, the only human being at that position. Yeah. The firstborn from the dead. Okay? That's where Jesus is now. That's what John is telling us. John knows that Jesus is glorified at the right hand of God. Okay, in the bosom of the Father, it's, it's the same word that's used later on in his gospel, where probably it's John himself sitting there next to Jesus. Remember at the Passover when he leaned on his bosom, okay? Uh, it's the same word. Right. So it means closeness, intimacy. And this is the position of Jesus the Messiah now, okay? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I have uh, another comment on that verse 18 there. This is from the NET, the New English Translation. It says that the textual problem is a notoriously difficult one. Only one letter would have differentiated the readings in the manuscript since both words would have been contracted as nomen sacra. Uh, mm -hmm. So then it goes on to talk about the manuscript evidence, which is pretty divided, and then uh, in the end, just like in Bruce Metzger's uh, textual commentary of the Greek New Testament, they conclude that we should read it as only begotten God because, or one and only God, because it's more difficult. 
and mm-hmm. it's more likely that a scribe would change it from God to son than from son to God. Now, they're not paying attention <laughs> to the historical controversy in the area, in the geographical area, where these God manuscripts were found, Alexandria. Mm-hmm. Alexandria. Mm-hmm. And Alexandria was the epicenter for the Christological debate of the 4th century when we get these manuscripts in the 5th century, like Codex Alexandrinus and so on, where you have this one and only or only begotten God reading. Now, that gives the scribe a heck of a lot of motivation to change mm-hmm. it from son to God, because that's exactly Alexander's point when he was in his, his argument with Arius in the early 4th century, and then subsequently later debates that raged on all the way up until the year 381. So we have we have over 60 years of controversy in the location where we find these manuscripts that have the change from son to God. And and yeah. I, I just really wish that some of these textual scholars would incorporate a little bit more of the historical controversy over whether or not Jesus is God into their discussion of these texts, rather than blindly following these arbitrary textual critical rules such as like the difficult reading is is to be preferred well i understand like the gist of that and the philosophy behind it but you can't blindly follow that rule without considering the history too so i think i think you're right i think this is just one of these things where we have different manuscripts and either side should not use john 118 to lean all their weight on because it is ambiguous or or uncertain at most uh, let's move on to John 5:18, uh, which mm-hmm. is a uh, a text that is sometimes bandied about as evidence for the Gospel of John teaching that Jesus in his ministry called himself God. I'll just read it out and uh, like to hear your thoughts on this. It says, John 5:18. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Mm-hmm. So it seems like the Jews got the point here that Jesus was claiming equality by calling God his father. He wasn't mm-hmm. just being humble here. What, what do you, what's your thought on that? Well, the first thing I would say is remember that in the Hebraic biblical mindset, the Messiah will call God his father. 2 Samuel chapter 7, God says of David's descendant, the king, the Messiah, I will call him my son, and he will call me father. Yes. Okay? In Psalm chapter 2, we have the same idea. In Psalm 89, we have the phrase, Psalm 89, 26, I think it is. Yep. Where this descent, glorifying the choice of God of the Davidic dynasty, this one says, calls out, my father, you are my God. Okay, so you have the Davidic son of God calling the Almighty his father. It doesn't mean, in essence, again, it means this is relationship, this is status, because this is the son who will inherit the father's kingdom. So to call God his father does not make himself equal in the sense of essence, once again. And this word, again, sometimes these are matters of translations. And quite honestly, Sean, translators and Bible teachers are going to have to, like Jesus said in Matthew 23, your judgment is going to be stricter. Sometimes yes. these translators, I mean, like, the, the, I believe it was the New Living Translation or the Living Translation. I, I, if I'm wrong, I'm, the name of the translation, I'm sorry, but in John 1, 1 starts out by saying something like, in the beginning was the, was the Christ, and the Christ was God. I mean, those guys are going to, they're going to have to face up to the Almighty for that translation, because how many people they brought astray on that is anybody's guess. So the same thing with a word like this. Right? We know that these are translations. You've got to go look at what does this word mean? They are accusing him to be equal with God. Were they really standing there thinking, hey, you're saying that you're God? No, the word means consistent. It's used in another place in the Gospels where the testimony of the false uh, witnesses at the trial of Jesus, the scriptures say in Mark, even so their testimony was not consistent. 
Okay, it's the exact same word. Their testimony did not agree. So this is what Jesus is doing, and this is what I think the religious leaders are saying. See, he has just healed a man on the Sabbath, a lame man on the Sabbath. And this is their argument against him, saying if he does this on the Sabbath, he can't be with God. He can't be of God. Because in their estimation, he's breaking the Sabbath. But now when he calls God Father, that's, it's a messianic claim. Okay? It's, it's saying that he is on the same page as God is. He's being consistent with God. He's being equal with God in the way God approaches the Sabbath. Now, if they did really, and I don't think they were in this case, maybe later on in John chapter 10, they, they're going to toss this thing out and you make yourself a God or you make yourself God or something, but not here. They're not, that's not what they're saying here. They're saying, oh, you're t- you're, you can't be Messiah because you're breaking the Sabbath. And, and you would say that God breaks the Sabbath then. That's what they're doing here. He makes himself consistent with God. Right, right. Something, something else, too, on this same chapter, and it comes up a few other times in chapter 8 and chapter 10 as well, is one of the, one of the themes in the Gospel of John is that there are insiders and outsiders to, Jesus, to belief in Jesus, and uh, those who are outside that, the unbelieving Jews, they, they pretty much always misunderstand Jesus, and they take him woodenly when he's speaking metaphorically, and he does not, more often than not, he does not clarify it for them. He makes it worse to point out how absurd their uh, perspective is, their antagonistic perspective is. And so the simple fact is we don't want to build our theology on what the unbelieving opponents of our Lord thought. Mm-hmm. We, want to bl- we want to build it on what Jesus himself said. And the very response that Jesus gives in the next verse is that, Amen, amen, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord. Exactly. So who are we throwing our lot in here with? The enemies of Jesus or Jesus himself? I mean, he says only the things that he sees the Father who's doing. He, mm-hmm. Only the things he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. The mm-hmm. Father loves the Son and shows him all that he is himself doing. And greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. And he goes on from there and talks about his role as the Son of Man. So, I, I mean, I think we, we, we need to be careful when we read the Gospel of John not to cherry pick one little verse out, and you know I appreciate how you brought in the context. You know he healed this guy; it was a healing done on the Sabbath, and obviously the father was partnering with Jesus in this so that mm-hmm. the healing could occur. And you know my father's working until now, and I'm working. You know, I mean it, it. It makes perfect sense in the in the context. I don't think we need to pick up stones and and declare homoousia or anything. You know, I mean that's yes. just. Uh, that's just misunderstanding what's going on. Absolutely. And you're right. Anytime we feel like we're siding with the understanding of Jesus' opponents, especially in the Gospel of John, watch out. Because the Gospel of John, John tells us very clearly, they did not understand him. Right? They didn't understand his figures. Twice the Gospel of John tells us that Jesus was speaking to them in figures, or figurative language. And anytime we start to say, oh, you know, they, J- Jesus' enemies, you see, what they, they knew he was claiming to be God, if we take their perspective, I would say watch out. That should be a red flag. You're probably in the wrong direction. I mean, it's right. even in simple things th- this day and age. I mean, th- things like being sent from God, okay? Jesus I was sent from God. Well, so was John the Baptist, right? Here's a man sent from God, or I came from heaven, right? This is an idiom to mean I'm of God. This is God's works, not man, right? Somehow we understand it when we, when we see those idioms connected with other people, like John the Baptist. Jesus says, John the Baptist, was it from heaven or from men, okay? Right. There we understand the idiom from heaven means it's of God. It's not man's ideas and just man generated. It's it's God working. Okay, we understand what John that is, but for some reason, when Jesus says, "I'm from heaven," we think, "Oh, he has you know descended somehow uh, from a pre-existent state and so forth." And you're, you're missing that. You're missing the idiom. Let's move on then to John eight fifty eight. This is 
probably in the top two or three of the verses in the Gospel of John that people interpret as Jesus claiming to be God. And uh, this is a, uh, I like to call it the Who's Your Daddy dialogue, uh, where Jesus and his interlocutors are really going into it. And uh, Jesus says, well, look, if Abraham were your father, then you would believe me. And, and they, they say that, oh, well, at least we're not born of fornication and uh, that you're a Samaritan. It, they, I mean, they really just pull out all the stops here. And mm. uh, Jesus says, well, your father's the devil. There's all this back and forth. I mean, it's a really heated dialogue. Mm. And then we get in verse 58, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Verse 59, so they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. And so the typical line of reasoning here by uh, defenders of the idea that Jesus just is God is to say that he here is, when he says, before Abraham was, I am, that that I am, and it's very suggestive in certain translations where it's all capitalized, is mm-hmm. actually a reference to Exodus 3 in the burning bush when God says to Moses, I am. I'm sure you've been familiar with that interpretation in the past. How is it that you're looking at this now? Well, honestly, Sean, this explanation, even as a Trinitarian, I never accepted. Oh, really? So when I look at it and I hear it now, it's a reason why I wouldn't accept the explanations. Because it just, it doesn't work. Let's put it that way. It, there's too much presupposition, too much forcing in, in a lot of different ways. First, first of all, I would say this. In this very same chapter, Jesus tells us that he is a man that heard the truth from God. Yeah, I think it's verse uh, 40, right? But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did, okay? So in that very same chapter, he tells us he's a man, all right? And then, let me also just point out, you have another use of a Hebraic, let's call it an idiom. Jesus tells him, you're of your father, the devil, okay? Now, is Jesus telling them you're of the same essence of the devil, right? You, you were born, you know, from some pre-existent state. And see, for again, for some reason, we get the idiom when it's applied to others, Right? These people, Jesus says, you are the, your father is the devil. Okay? But we don't think, oh, they're the same essence. No, we just understand that they're thinking from the, you know, the devil's way of thinking, and he, maybe he's influenced them and, and their behavior. Right, this I mean, is another thing. Right. nobody thinks that the devil had some sort of divine conception like God and with Mary, that the mm-hmm. devil is now producing offspring. I mean, nobody thinks that. Not that I know of. I mean, they they get the idiom here. You're right. So that's a little off track, but it's worth all the point out. Now, another thing they do two times in the same passage is they accuse Jesus of having a demon. Okay? Now, I think some of the religious leaders in Jesus' time probably thought that. I think others, they were just using it as a way to try and discredit Jesus in the eyes of his followers. Because we cannot forget that Jesus has thousands and thousands of followers. And the religious leaders want to discredit him in the eyes of these followers. So they're going to use this. We see it in the synoptics a lot. You know, they attribute his works to Satan. You're uh, the prince of the, the demons, so that's why you can command them to go out and come in and this kind of thing. And they say it's the same thing here. You see that showing up. You have a demon, uh, verse 48. Are we not right in saying you're a Samaritan, you have a demon? Okay, and then when then Jesus when he says that anybody who keeps my word will never see death, they say, oh, now we are right, and you have a demon, right? Abraham died. Here's what's going on, I would say. Jesus is part of the plan of God from the beginning. So when he says that Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad, now look how they misinterpret it. They twist it, and they say, you're not yet 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham? That's not what Jesus said, okay? Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and saw it and was glad. He didn't say that he saw Abraham. They twisted around. They say, oh, you're not 50 years old. You've seen Abraham? And then Jesus says to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am 
What? Just, does that go back to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14? Come on. That, that kind of an argument was just didn't, didn't fly with me, even in my Trinitarian days, because he's not speaking Greek. I don't think Jesus is speaking Greek to the Jewish religious leaders on the Temple Mount. No. Maybe he is, but it's very, very, very unlikely. No way, no way. So the, the idiom maybe kind of looks a little bit like it in Greek, but even that doesn't work because it leaves out the main part of the Greek translation of Exodus 3.14, right? You got the ego a me, I am, mm -hmm. but you don't have the living one, that next word in Greek. Oh, okay? oh yeah. Exactly. Now, several other times in the same chapter, Jesus says, I am, right? Unless you believe that I am he. You can look back in verse 24. How do the English translations translate it there? Do the translations, I think it's the, the, uh, the New King James that capitalizes the I am there in 858. Do they, do they translate I am? Uh, do they capitalize it back there in verse 24 where Jesus said, unless you believe that I'm, I am he? Okay, they're all supplying the pronoun. Same thing in verse 28. When you've lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. Okay, and I'm going to guess that even the King James and the New King James that capitalize that I am, that they, they translate the pronoun back there in, in verse uh, 24 and verse 28. I am he. I am what? The Messiah. Or you might even go back to the beginning of part of this chapter where Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Jesus is saying that he is, he has a universal significance and that God's plan from the beginning of who he was and would be is now coming to pass. And Abraham, the Lord revealed to Abraham how this would all work out. Abraham had the gospel preached to him. Abraham knew that his descendant would be this one that would be the king, right? that would restore the earth to the way it's supposed to be. Abraham knew this and he was glad to see it. And he, he rejoiced in it, just like we can rejoice in the expectation of the coming kingdom. And maybe we've got a little glimpse of it here and there. I think Abraham had a stronger glimpse than even we've had of, of the coming kingdom. But there's definitely a sense in which Abraham knew that God would work through his descendant. And he rejoiced. This is what Jesus is talking about. Paul even makes reference to the fact, I think it's, uh, it's Galatians Galatians 3.8. The scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all nations be blessed. Okay, this is Paul in Galatians 3, 8, where he says, the gospel was preached beforehand to Abraham. Now, I think this is probably in God's promised covenants with Abraham, Genesis 12, 3, Genesis 18, Genesis 22, where God is making these promises to Abraham, and he, he has some understanding that this is all going to happen with this designated Messiah, King, his own descendant. This is what Jesus is saying. Yes, yes. I, I also noticed that about 10 verses later, after John 8, 58, we have the same exact Greek construction once again, but it's on the lips of the blind man who had mm -hmm. been healed. And it reads in the ESV, some said, it is he, others said, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. uh, which I think is an interesting translation. It's the exact same phrase, it just in Greek literally says, I am. Mm -hmm. But here they, they supplied the man. Uh, or the uh, New American Standard Bible says, I am the one. Mm -hmm. And so if we, if we allow those same rules to apply grammatically in, other, in the other place in John 8, 58, it means that I am the one. I am the one who was promised. I mean, he is... If you think about it, God's promise to Abraham that he would have a descendant, that those descendants would be multiplied, that through his seed all the nations would be blessed. How did that all come to pass? Well, yes, the descendants multiplied like the sand on the seashore, like the stars in the heavens, but in the end it was all this one representative, quintessential descendant of Abraham called Jesus who was able to accomplish the ultimate climactic redemption that God had in mind from way back in those days so that that blessing of Abraham could be extended not 
only to the Jews, but even to us who are Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is, this is really something that makes a lot of sense if you read it in context and don't just take this one verse out and capitalize it and use uh, funny grammar on it. Yep, absolutely. Another thing, Sean, is there's many other places where there's evidence of God's foreknowledge and plan. Let me just read one from 1 Peter 1.20 about the Messiah. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world but was made manifest in the last times for your sake. So here's the biblical understanding that God's plan and purpose and intention as it relates to the coming of Messiah, Jesus, was foreknown from before the foundation of the world. And that's why Jesus can say such a thing. And in some ways, Jesus is saying, hey, I'm greater than Abraham. He's not saying it in a boastful way, but he's saying that I'm part of the fulfillment of God's plan through Abraham, with God choosing Abraham, making those promises. He, he's known from before the foundation of the world. And there's many references in a similar vein that describe how God knows what he's, and has planned what's going to happen from before. Even our position. I'll read just a, a, a verse here from Ephesians 1, verse 3 and following, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus the Messiah. That's interesting. Jesus our Messiah has a God and Father. Right. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus the Messiah, who has blessed us in the Messiah with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. There's Jesus again in the heavens. Now, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. We're chosen in him, right? Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption through Jesus the Messiah according to the purpose of his will. See, these things were planned by God yeah. from before the foundation of the world. And Revelation 13 is another known verse of uh, the Lamb who was slain from before the foundation of the world. How could the Lamb be slain from before the foundation of the world? Okay, It's in the plan and purpose and intention of God. Well, that's it for today. Next time, we'll pick up right where we left off and cover five more of those texts from the Gospel of John in 